Okay, welcome to the uh, second Cerebri Diversity and Inclusion Speaker Series. Uh, I'm Arun Prakash, and I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Today we have Dr. Chinna Natesan, who is a professor of marketing at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. And he's going to speak with us about uh, Hinduism and how it applies to business. He's a leader in the Hindu community in Austin, Texas, and we're very happy to have him here. Thank you, Chinna. Hey, thank you, Arun, for having me here. I'm glad to be here as part of the inclusion series. And uh, Hinduism is basically a very inclusive religion. Uh, you know, uh, people think of it as uh, religion, but it is, uh, it is more a way of life. It's called uh, Sanatana Dharma. Uh, and uh, it, the word Hindu comes from the word Sindhu. And Sindhu is the geographical term for people who live beyond the Indus River. Basically, it was the Indo-Gangetic Plain, as they call it, which was very fertile, and people from all over the world flocked to this area. Um, the first universities in India, the world were uh, in this area, Nalanda and Takshila, and uh, the first uh, civilizations, Indo-Harappan civilization, and all of that started in this fertile basin. So it basically is a geographical term for people who lived there. And uh, Hinduism is basically a group or a, a, you know, a broad range of religious, philosophical, cultural traditions that are native to India. Uh, it is not anything, one specific thing. It doesn't have a founder. It does not have a prophet. It has no governing body, no ecclesiastical authority, no binding holy book. Uh, it's a diversity of ideas that make this group of people who live in that area. And uh, today it has the largest following of about, third largest following of about 15% of the global population, which basically is from India. This is what Hinduism is, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, means to the Western mind. Okay, and uh, a few other things with respect to Hinduism. People always talk about, you know, who's the god in Hinduism, because they have always known Hinduism to be of many gods, 33 million gods, uh, you know, a billion gods, as many gods as there are people, and so on. But uh, uh, for Hinduism, uh, the god is basically the rhythm of the universe, the ritha. Uh, uh, it's the universal set of laws that governs the universe, and it represents order. That's what is god. Uh, they also call it Brahman, okay, and that comes in the later stages in the Upanishads. And it's basically the highest universal principle or the ultimate reality, the truth. And it is genderless. The God is not a he or a she. Um, it is all pervasive, it's infinite, and it is bliss. Uh, so they talk about it as sat chit ananda, which means, you know, it's truth, it's consciousness, and it's bliss. That's what is God, happiness. And it is not within you. They tell you that happiness is you. And that comes in the next set, which, you know, basically talks about dharma or what exactly is dharma. Dharma is anything that follows the ritha, the rhythm. Anything that goes, uh, actions that go follow this rhythm of the universe is what is called dharma. Anything that, is, uh, that disturbs the harmony is called aridha or adharma, okay? So... Any duty or obligation that realizes the greater good and is in consonance with the laws of nature, that's what is dharma. And it is guided by the unity of all life on earth, okay? And it's inherent order in the world, okay? Uh, it provides us with a universe full of beauty and elegance. So it's about unity. Uh, in diversity of thought, unity in diversity of peoples, unity in diversity of living beings, uni unity in diversity of everything. And it's the basic order underlying. And as long dharma is keeping that order afloat, and anything that is adharma is what is not in order or disharmony. So the next thing that uh, people ask is, what is your scripture? Where does this all come from? Okay, 
and the most ancient of scriptures is the Vedas. I mean, you know, it's documented to be 5,000 years old, but it is supposed to be even older than that. Uh, but uh, the, these Vedas is just a compendium of knowledge. Veda means just knowledge. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, it is just a compendium of knowledge. It is, it is supposed to have been revealed to the sages during meditation. So it is people who, who, who have created this. It's not some outside source that created it and, and gave it. So within the Vedas, there are four major Vedas that survived uh, because it's all passed through oral tradition uh, initially. So the four major Vedas are the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda. These are the four Vedas. The Rig Veda is the most ancient. It is basically a compendium of hymns. That's what the Rig Veda is. Yajur Veda is all uh, associated with rituals, rituals with respect to uh, fire sacrifices and offerings called the Homa. That's what the uh, Yajur Veda is. Sama Veda is basically a songbook set to melody. This is the only way that they could communicate uh, this without any uh, you know, communication gaps. So whatever was memorized, it was committed to memory and sent uh, you know, through the ages, through songs that, that you could memorize and communicate. That's what the Sama Veda is. And Atharva Veda is basically living stuff, formulate for living. So people forget that these formulae were developed over a period of time. It's about identifying the right herbs for illnesses. So it talks about health. It talks about governance. Um, it talks about what a king should do. It talks about people and how do they live, you know, their various stages, you know, uh, at the time of death. Pardon? Is it large? Or? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty large. They're like, you know, each one is like about a, a thousand hymns and it all it all varies. It's a, it's a big uh, body of text. Uh, uh, so there are these four Vedas and they say that there were more and some were lost. And even within the Vedas, they say that some of the uh, things have, uh, have been left out, have been lost. And then there are also these add-ons that have come over periods of time. So it has evolved, but basically it was committed to writing about 5,000 years ago. So, so, and it was written in a language called Sanskrit. And Sanskrit hasn't changed, by the way. Uh, the grammar, the basic uh, meanings, the word structure, everything has remained uh, the same for over 5,000 years. This is, again, a very ancient language. It's an Indo-European language. Uh, and uh, basically, the people who lived here were called the Aryans. It's not our job to go into the Aryan migration theory. There's all kinds of theories going along. And it all depends on your political leaning. Just as much as climate changes today, uh, 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 this Aryan philosophy is also based on uh, you know, political leanings. So, so the right wing in India thinks that that uh, all of this originated in India and moved outwards. And then there are other people who think it was outwards that moved in. So, uh, and there's a lot of genetic testing and all of that going on, DNA stuff that's going on, that's proving or disproving this theory. But basically the Vedas are from this area. Uh, it's a Indo-European language, Sanskrit, and it's been uh, committed in that language. So, Are any new ones being discovered from time to time? Uh, no. Other than these four basic ones, there's nothing new. But there are other newer scriptures that comes from Vedanta. And that also has evolved. So to answer your question, the next one is called Upanishads. And Upanishads is basically, you know, sit near me and I'll tell you. Uh, it's kind of, that's what it means. So, mm -hmm. so uh, it's, uh, it's called Vedanta, the end of the Vedas. Uh, and uh, they have like two, uh, you know, they say four Mahavakyas, four major sayings. But we'll talk about two because that's relevant to us. What it talks about is Tattva Masi, that thou art. Basically, it says that God is you, okay? So, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am God. So, God is in you, or you are in God, or God is a small part of you. Now, all of these are very philosophical concepts that Hinduism, you know, fleshes out. Different philosophical schools flesh them out differently. There's one school called Advaita, and Advaita is basically you and God are the same. God is in you, you just have to realize that God. And the Dvaita philosophy is basically God is separate, 
there is a paramatman that's the bigger consciousness the global consciousness and then there is you which is the atman which is consciousness and as long as you uh, seek paramatma then that is uh, that's a dualistic philosophy called dvaita dvaita means dual and basically christianity uh, uh, all the abrahamic religions are all dualistic philosophies that you got to realize and uh, you know reach god which is uh, outside of you but advaita is is, a, is another philosophical stream uh, which basically says that god is in you you are god and you have to realize that uh, the next set of scriptures are basically puranas and the puranas are you know hindu folklore they eulogize the various deities and uh, the various deities being you know those 33 million gods or how many ever gods that that you want but these gods are are not actually uh, hinduism is a monotheistic religion there's only one god which is that universal order but uh, these gods represent various uh, uh, you know uh, concepts and ideals that one would want to uh, emulate so so for example in my house you know my favorite god you know, my favorite god or ishta devata they call it is ganesha he's the remover of obstacles he's pot bellied he's got a uh, elephant head on him and there's a whole puranic story uh, talking about how he came about and what he does and so on and my uh, wife's uh, uh, favorite deity is shiva he's the uh, in the hindu trinity he's the destroyer he's the meditator uh, you know uh, um, you know he's the person who brings about destruction he's about power and all of that and without him life cannot exist because without destruction there's no creation without dissolution there is no creation so that's um, my wife's favorite deity my son's favorite deity is uh, hanuman he is the monkey god uh, all kids love him he's the superhero he jumps out at the sky uh, he thought that it was an orange and he wanted to eat it and and it's uh, it's hanuman my daughter's is krishna i mean you know who who wouldn't love uh, uh, this god who's a cowherd uh, you know to whom uh, all the gopis sing songs and all of that so her favorite is krishna but basically it doesn't matter who your ishta devata is they all have certain concepts and ideas uh, that are uh, you know uh, delineated through the puranas and these are stories and uh, you choose the god that you love and uh, you know uh, basically you choose the form that you uh, that you can most associate with and then uh, you know you work towards the ideals that that god embodies that's what the puranas are for uh, the next set is itihasas which is basically history and for indians and hindus history consists of two major epics one is called the ramayana and then the other is called the mahabharata Uh, ramayana is about uh, the ideal man and mahabharata is about living in a family living in society and the pulls and pressures of living in a family and in a society and how do you reconcile your individual actions with re- with respect to societal order and so on so how do you reconcile that so that's the mahabharata and within the mahabharata there is a um, uh, there's a small portion which is uh, you know talked by krishna to arjuna on a battlefield uh, and this basically symbolizes the battlefield of the mind and in that battlefield of the mind um, you know krishna is advising arjuna how to navigate all of this and that song is called the bhagavad gita it's called the god song and today many people say hey you know i would like to use the bhagavad gita to swear on Uh, just like the bible because uh, you know that embodies a lot of all this vedic tradition and so on in that one song it's about 700 verses and uh, uh, this uh, god song as it is called uh, you know gives you a lot of uh, stuff that we can use to live to work and so on that's what this uh, uh, the scripture is so this is how the scriptures have come about and one thing that uh, all technology people have heard about is uh, guru i don't know uh, how many of uh, you really know the meaning of the word guru guru just means you know dispeller of darkness the one who leads you to light that's what guru actually means so he's basically a teacher a guide a master uh, 
Um, so, uh, but, and, and Hindus look upon this master, this guide, to guide them on this path towards self-realization, realizing that God is in you. So he's the guide who takes you up the mountain top. Now, there are many gurus, there are many paths. Uh, uh, there is no single path to the mountaintop. Uh, even for Mount Everest, you know, there are like three different paths that you can take when you get to the summit, uh, near the summit. But till you get to base camp, there are very many paths to get to base camp. So, so uh, there are very many paths to get there. That's why Hinduism uh, accepts all religions as all of them leading to this ultimate realization of this one universal truth. So, so that's why in Hinduism there is no conversion. Nobody talks of, hey, you got to convert to the Hindu path. Because within the Hindu path, there are a thousand different paths to to reach this goal of realization. And uh, um, you know, very many masters who come in and who tell you how to reach this uh, uh, goal of self-realization. And the Hindu tradition has a, uh, you know, is very strong in questioning authority. Okay, they constantly question authority in order to deepen understanding. Um, uh, and you know, uh, the purpose is to develop this philosophical concepts much further. And that's why, because it's an ancient religion, it has addressed all of the issues that today younger religions are grappling with. Everything has been covered and they've found ways to address all of these issues. Uh, basically, these concepts are refined through debate, uh, not through putting somebody to the sword, not through inquisition, not through any of that. It is all resolved through open debate. And uh, there's a record of all of these debates. Uh, um, you know, the most recent is, you know, Shankara, Adi Shankara, and he's the, uh, the head of the modern trend of gurus. Everybody would say, hey, you know, Adi Shankara is my uh, Parama guru, who's, you know, the most, uh, uh, the guru that from whose lineage I come from. So he's a big reformer. He's reformed uh, a lot of things in Hinduism that have been attributed because Hinduism is a living kind of a religion. It changes and the paths to the top keep changing. Um, so uh, he's the guru and any guru, uh, there's no specific guru that, you, that they tell that you got to take. Uh, so, so you choose a guru you, you are comfortable with as long as you're on this path to uh, you know, self-realization. That's the goal. Uh, there are three major paths in Hinduism uh, of this uh, way to realization. One is called bhakti, which is devotion and faith. Uh, this is the path that you know Buddha led. This is also the path of Jesus. They talk about faith, devotion, love your neighbor, you know, uh, love everybody as yourself, and that is the path that they say. Another one is jnana. Jnana is about knowledge. This is about refutation. This is about logic. Uh, this is about studying stuff and and coming up with uh, with a way to understand the world around you. So so they allow for that as well. Uh, then there's a third path which is uh, which is more relevant for us in a workday environment and in the world of work. It's the path of karma, karma yoga, which is selfless action. So it's not just action. It talks about it as selfless action. So, so that's what karma yoga is. And people wonder what yoga is. Yoga is actually, uh, you know, uh, the union of body and mind. So basically in this world for self-realization, you got to have a body and in that body, you got to have a mind. And if the body is not well, is not functioning well, your mind cannot function well. So the first thing that they tell you is take care of your body. The body is the temple. And in fact, if you, if you talk about temples in Hinduism, temples are basically a reflection of a human body. That's the way it is constructed. So you go into any Hindu temple, they'll talk about how in Vastu Shastra, how a temple is basically a human body. And that's how a temple is constructed. And so in this body, you have this mind. And that mind is what will help you realize. And if you don't realize, Hindus don't think that you'll be consigned to hell or heaven or anything like that. They'll tell you you'll be given another chance, another body to come back and realize that you are 
uh, this consciousness. So, so you can keep on coming back as long as you have desires. So if you have a desire that you want to be this person, then you will come back as that person. That's what Hindus believe. That's what the karma theory is. So they tell you that as long as you quell your desires, then you can realize, you can calm the mind, and then you can realize who you are, which is the supreme consciousness. So it also gives you, uh, you know, the four purushatas. They tell you that these are all the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, different pursuits that people have. And they also find it that all of these pursuits are okay. And, uh, but then they tell you to build on those pursuits. It's somewhat similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, so in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll have, you know, first you've got to fulfill all your, you know, physiological uh, needs, your safety needs, and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, in the Hindu thing, it's about, you know, artha. Artha is the pursuit of material wealth. Hindus don't think that pursuing material wealth is a bad thing. In fact, they say without material wealth, you cannot keep your body and soul together. You've got to put, at the end of the day, you've got to put food on the table. So they say the first thing that you pursue is artha. And then you, you know, you come up to kama. Kama is the fulfilling of one's desires, which is the next step also in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's all about love and belonging, uh, esteem and accomplishment. These are the things that, that you talk about. It's all about your desires, what you want to fulfill. That's kama. And they tell you that's okay. That's a path that you want to go through. And then fire, the next one that they talk about is dharma, which is, again, we talked about it earlier. Dharma is basically your rightful duties. And again, when they talk about duties, they don't talk about duties as this is right or wrong. Um, they talk about duties as, you know, depends on your station in life. If you're a student, your duties are different. If you're a householder, if you're a family man, then your, uh, um, you know, duties are different. Your duties to your families, to your children, to make sure that they, uh, you know, that you give them a, a place in life and you give them a upbringing and so on, teach them values and so on. And then as a retiree, your duties are different. So, and then finally, as a renunciate, your duties are different. So just to give you, you know, uh, in the tech world, you know, Bill Gates. Bill Gates has gone through his uh, phases of uh, acquisition of wealth, artha, kama, he's fulfilled all his desires. He's number one in what he does. And then now he's at a station where he's retired, but then the overall duty of serving the common good hasn't gone away. So which is what he's doing through charities, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and he's done it so phenomenally well. And the Hindus say that, you know, you've got to go one step further, which is finally realize that you are God. That's the realization. So that's what is called moksha. Moksha is liberation. You are liberated from the cycle of uh, birth and death only when you realize that that you are none other than God, and you've got to realize that, that supreme consciousness. And that will happen only when you look at the big picture, that you are one in everything, that you are one with uh, another human being, that you are one with, uh, with a person who's very different from you, that you are one with, uh, uh, you know, the animals that you see, the one with nature. Till you see and identify that universality, you are not going to achieve moksha. That's what, you're, that's what they talk about. Finally, karma yoga, just to develop a little bit on karma yoga. What they talk about is uh, your work is your responsibility. Do not look at results. They talk about never let the fruits of your action be your motive. And they tell you do not give in to inaction just because uh, you, know, you, you, you don't want the fruits of it. So they say, set firmly in yourself, do your work, but do not get attached to anything. Because the problem is when you got attached to something, that's when all the dualities come, the dualities of right and wrong, uh, you know, uh, um, you know um, uh, happiness and sorrow, uh, cold and hot, all of those dualities. So they're telling get above those dualities. And how do you get above those dualities is they are talking about equanimity and evenness of mind. And they say, finally, even mindedness uh, in dealing, dealing with things dispassionately is true yoga. So, so the higher up you go in an organization, just like in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 
the higher up you go in an organization, uh, they want you to be in that position of being dispassionate. So anytime you make decisions with a clear mind, with a dispassionate mind, that's when your decisions will be right. And uh, to get to that, they talk about various techniques uh, and all of that, and uh, uh, that'll be uh, uh, for another uh, speaker series about how to do meditation, how that helps clear your mind, how to be dispassionate and all of that. But if you guys have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer. But that basically gives you a synopsis of of uh, Hinduism and how it, uh, uh, its world view. The, the first question is, uh, um, the language that you must study the texts in, and how do you go about becoming expert in the texts? And who basically says you're an expert? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Catholic, so we have a very predefined uh -huh. Priests go through a certain amount of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, education, and there's a it's a pretty elaborate mm -hmm. uh, methodology to make sure that uh, that they have some view mm -hmm. on, uh, on an understanding of the basic text. So how do you go about doing that? So this they leave it. It's like Linux. <laughs> so it's open source. Uh, it's it's open source. <laughs> it's open source, and whatever is good gets absorbed, and so. You, you, keep, uh, you keep adding to it. There is no uh, one guy who decides everything. And what language? Is it uh, multi-language? Uh, again, the language is uh, uh, Sanskrit is the source language. It's Latin. Uh, it's the equivalent of Latin. Yeah. But uh, there are many languages. Like in India, for example, there are 15 different uh, official languages. Um, uh, you know, there's so many dialects and so on. And in every language, these texts have been, uh, you know, uh, modified, changed, uh, adopted, made into, like, I, I speak Tamil, uh, which is from southern India. It's a state. And, um, you know, the Vedas are, they say, is encapsulated in Tirukural, which is, you know, uh, uh, by a saint poet. Uh, who, who encapsulated it in about 1,000, you know, 300 verses. And he talks about all of this and that. So every language, uh, it depends on the people, where you are from, uh, even the Puranas. Even Ramayana has been written in different languages for, for uh, uh, you know, for different people. And even the Ramayana story changes according to different, uh, uh, you know, different regions of India. So there is no, there is no one, uh, one uh, uh, what's that called, uh, one authority that decides this is it. Uh, and so it evolves and uh, it's good uh, because now it gives you multiplicity of views and they debate. Uh, so uh, constantly these debates happen. Uh, and uh, based on those debates, let the better man win the argument. That's the way Hinduism views it. So a couple of uh, basic questions, things that people know about in the West, which uh, we probably don't understand. The first one is the caste system uh -huh. and how that evolved, mm -hmm. because it does it sounds incongruous relative to what you were uh, speaking mm -hmm. about earlier. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the second is the the, uh, the age old question about how do cows end up fitting in all of this? Because everyone wonders uh -huh. uh, how how that works. Yeah. Uh, uh, first, let me address the caste system. Uh, again, uh, you know, it is there in the text, but it has been misinterpreted and, you know, uh, maligned in the West. Uh, 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 let me give you an example. Basically, they say the Varnas, the four Varnas, uh, the castes that they talk about in the Hindu text, uh, they say is based on the Gunas, that is, everybody has their own way of, uh, you know, it's their specialization. It's based on, you know, uh, they talk about sattva guna, rajas, and tamas, and all of that. And the text basically says it's, uh, it's uh, based on those gunas. And that's how it evolves. So you could be anybody you want. There was a lot of social mobility uh, within uh, in India uh, at the time of, uh, you know, when these texts were written. So if you were knowledgeable, you would be... Uh, uh, Brahman, which is a person who pervades knowledge, uh, uh, that's what you would be. And if you were good at, you know, farming, if you were good at agriculture and all of that, you would be of a different caste. And if you were good with, uh, uh, you know, a soldier who was uh, very rajasic, 
that is you know uh, active and so on then you are a kshatriya caste um, i actually belong to a vaishya caste by if you talk about a caste nomenclature where i come from i am a chetiyar uh, which is a vaishya caste i am a businessman I, you know my forefathers were salt traders and that's what we were but today i am a professor today i am a brahman uh, you know i purvey knowledge uh, and that's what i do so for a living there is a lot of social mobility it was built in and over a period of time it fossilized and when it fossilized is because of power so whoever wanted to be at the who they thought were at the top of the chain wanted to hold on to that power and they said you could get in here only if you were born as so and so not because you at what time period uh, is this uh, it's a, it's a over a period of time and it has also changed like adi shankara for example in 8th century he is walking along a path he's the big reformer and reformation has happened and uh, this adi shankara is walking along a path and there is this person who comes in front of him and he's considered to be a shudra and uh, um, you know the followers of adi shankara just like everywhere tell him you know get out of the way of this brahman this great saintly person and adi shankara says no he i see god in him just as much as i am god and and they say the story is that that person that shudra who came in front of him what is was actually shudra so shudra is the bottom of the caste pile he's the person who's a tribal who who doesn't shave who doesn't bathe who lives in the forest and so he's considered as unclean by the brahmans who who took a ritual bath in the morning in the evening and in some places take baths five times a day so so you know there is all these exaggerations of how it is but the reformation has been constantly going on this this caste system is not something new it has been there and it has been reformed and then again it comes back and then again it gets reformed and uh, of late 200 years ago it was raja ramohan roy then vivekananda who came to the us was the first person who brought hinduism to the west to the us talked about reformation talked about that there is no caste system and then there's mahatma gandhi who said you know if you're a railway sweeper be the ra- best railway sweeper you can be he talked about cleaning latrines latrines is basically a toilet which is a dry toilet and so he talked about i'm going to clean latrines because i don't want them and he called the shudras harijans children of god so this reformation keeps going on but what happens is it is easy to peg so westerners always take this because they want to say hit up on hinduism and say hey you got this caste system going on and that's why we don't like you so so they use this it's a nice peg to hang things but the reformation is happening today in the cities uh, there is nothing like uh, uh, you know the caste is there matrimonial columns talk about caste but there's so much love marriage people are intermingling uh, today it's broken down in the cities still in rural areas there is still some effects of this but it changes that's that's about the caste system but let me tackle the next question which is which is more important uh, you know for your uh, for your audience and that question was if you can repeat it one more time for the audience the and then i the cows the cows <laughs> yeah okay. everyone talks about that everyone talks about that so let me to lighten this up let me talk I'll talk about that as uh, it every culture every group of people like certain things like certain animals and they like it for a variety of reasons uh, in the united states for example nobody would talk about killing a dog or eating dog meat because dog is considered to be a man's best friend and you know we have so many pets here there are uh, you know so many dogs here so many cats here and all of that and we don't ever talk of doing uh, eating a dog but if you go to korea dog meat is you know uh, is a delicacy people eat dog meat okay in china it's it's similar now you wouldn't eat horse meat here but there are people who eat horse meat right now now every culture has got certain things that they value and the hindus value cows over a period of time now if you talk about ancient times in the vedas in the homa they have talked about offering a cow as a sacrifice 
Uh, they have offered beef as a sacrifice. They have eaten beef. It's not like Hindus never ate beef. They had eaten beef uh, you know, in the olden times. Over a period of time, the cow became valued. And the reason it became valued is during the agricultural period, the cow was, was everything to you. You used the cow to plow your fields. It gave you milk. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, it, it gave you cow dung, which was used as uh, firewood. Uh, it was used to start a fire. So everything about a cow was considered to be very useful. So they said, you know, don't kill a cow because India is dependent on monsoons, and monsoons are rains, and sometimes the rains don't happen. And if the rains don't happen, uh, you know, the, they'll tell you two things not to destroy. One is the seed, because without the seed, when the rains do come, you cannot have another harvest. And the other thing that they tell you don't touch is the cow, because if you have eaten your cow, then you will not have it. It's like your capital investment. You will not have that capital when you go forward. So then they tell you don't touch cows. So uh, as things changed, you know, again, the religious right wing in India would tell you, you kill a cow, I'm going to, you're going to go to hell and all of that. If that was the case, I would have gone to hell several times because, you know, when I came to Texas, uh, you know, I loved uh, chicken fried steak and I thought chicken fried steak was chicken till one of my <laughs> colleagues, uh, you know, we went to uh, lunch one day and my colleague said, hey, you're going to go to hell. I said, no, I'm not going to go to hell. So he said, you're eating beef. And I thought that Hindus didn't eat beef. I said, no, I'm not eating beef. I'm eating chicken. So then my colleague said, hey, the operative word is not beef. It's not uh, steak. It is chicken. So that's when I realized that chicken fried steak was beef. But it has nothing to do with, you know, uh, today. Uh, if, if that's what you want to eat, you know, be my guest. Uh, you're not going to go to hell. Uh, you're not going to go to heaven just because you ate something else. But uh, Hinduism talks about ahimsa. Uh, it leads us on to this really serious uh, topic which is non-violence towards anything, uh, any living being. Uh, so it includes animals, it includes, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, it includes everything. So as far as possible, be non-violent. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, you know, talked about ahimsa. And that's why he said that you could even take the yoke of oppression, of colonial oppression, through ahimsa through non-violent means. And, uh, uh, and basically he said, you know, you just appeal to their conscience and that's what he was talking about. And once you appeal to people's conscience, it'll always work. He talked about disobedience, uh, which is where Martin Luther King got his ideas of how to, you know, uh, uh, work with the political system here and uh, give uh, blacks who are disenfranchised a voice, a vote. And that's what he followed. So, so these are all uh, uh, concepts that uh, that uh, people, uh, because of all the popular media, it makes interesting sound bites. So, so they talk about cows. The the so you're saying that uh, Hinduism is in effect a capitalist religion because the capital was kept in the cow and therefore yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah they preserved the capital <laughs> yeah yeah they exactly. Preserved it. What, one of the uh, things we hear about in uh, in the West is the rising uh, tide of uh, Hinduism in the political process mm -hmm. in India, and so uh, it, it it sounds intolerant to us because we don't know all of the uh, facts unless you travel there. Mm -hmm. I was in Dubai last week, and after 16 hours just flying, I'm not even in India yet, so it's mm -hmm. far it's far away. So yeah. we don't get a lot of the uh, uh, details. So how is that? Um, uh, progressing vis-a-vis -vis all the things you talked about? Uh, again, uh, uh, with respect to Hinduism, it's a majority population. Hindus uh, account for like about 80 to 85 percent of the population. And uh, a lot of other younger religions are making inroads. Not that Christianity was not there. Uh, uh, you know, Thomas the Apostle at the time of Jesus uh, had traveled to Kerala and uh, uh, Judaism is in India. Again, it's in uh, Kerala. Uh, ancient religions have always been there. Uh, uh, Islam, 
came through the Mughal conquerors. Uh, uh, so they have been there. So it's a melting pot. Uh, and all of these religions have been there for a long time. And while all of these religions have been there for a long time, they have always, you know, with, uh, you know, there have been issues, but they have always lived in harmony. Uh, Akbar, uh, you know, married, uh, uh, you know, several Hindu wives. He talked about Deen Ilahi, which is a religion that, uh, uh, that comprises of all of these religions that were there at a time. He tried to say that is one syncretic form that we need to come up with. But uh, uh, these things do happen. But what happened was the polarization ca uh, came just at the time the British were leaving India. And uh, they, uh, they felt that uh, you know, divide and rule was a good policy. There were 3,000 British uh, officers who were ruling at that time 300 million people. And the only way that 3,000 officers could rule 300 million people is to keep them fighting with each other, keep fighting princes with each, uh, you know, different princes to fight with other princes, uh, different kings to fight with other kings, and different religious people to fight with different religious people. And so as they were leaving uh, the partition, Pakistan and India, Pakistan became a uh, Muslim country, uh, Bangladesh became, you know, was part of Pakistan. And so they divided India into two, a Hindu majority India and a exclusively uh, Muslim Pakistan, although there are Hindus in Pakistan that, that not many people talk about, and there are some Christians in Pakistan as well. But in, Hindu, in India, there are a lot more Hindus. So this partition was a, was a big problem. And, uh, and at the time of partitioning, uh, there was a lot of political upheaval. They said, shouldn't India be united? There was one stream of thought. Uh, another stream of thought was, you know, let them go their way. We needed to be a Hindu India. And that's where the resurgence of Hindu nationalism started. And it was uh, fueled by uh, the politics at that time. Uh, the politics uh, are talked about uh, not, uh, uh, you know, uh, towing the majoritarian line, uh, uh, you know, line of thought. They always thought that the minorities have to be appeased. So there was a series of uh, legal maneuvers, a series of court cases that were overturned by uh, parliament, uh, which, which accorded different kinds of statuses to different groups of people. So if you were a Christian, you had Christian law. If you were a Muslim, you had Muslim law. If you were a Hindu, you had Hindu law. I mean, there is no other country that would give you a law based on which religion you practiced. Uh, India gave that. And, uh, and so when you had all these kinds of things, uh, suddenly the Hindus felt that, uh, uh, that uh, they were not being treated right. Uh, and so this resurgence started. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's the explanation for why this uh, right-wing nationalism has come in today. And so again, it's a democratic process. People are voting, people are electing. It's the freest, the fairest democracy in the world. Uh, this democracy has been really uh, the most uh, popular democracy. America has the longest serving democracy and India has the uh, largest democracy. We are like, you know, 1.1 uh, billion people and America is like 380 million people. And elections have been free and fair for all, uh, for, uh, you know, ever since our independence, since 47. So, so the democratic process will work its way through and the rule of the people and the will of the people uh, will finally rule. Okay, well, uh, one question that came uh, as well from uh, our staff was, what, Im what Im uh, of Hinduism impacted your career in marketing the most, uh, because uh, uh, our last speaker, who was uh, an imam here in uh, mm -hmm. Austin, was an electrical engineer. So we've had a uh, we've had a variety of backgrounds uh -huh. over the past uh, a few weeks. So how how has that impacted your professional life? Uh, I was, uh, you know, I started my career. I'm, uh, my undergrad is in statistics. Um, I we, won't, with, we won't hold that against you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, worked with uh, data and all of that. And then uh, my first job uh, was in uh, uh, sales, was in pharmaceutical sales. In uh, which country? Uh, uh, this was in India. Yeah. I worked with GlaxoSmithKline in India. 
And uh, that was because, you know, I did what I love best, which was, you know, uh, uh, converting other people to my thoughts. Uh, I was the secretary, uh, student government secretary in my university, in my college. And so I got the job as a, a pharmaceutical sales rep and uh, Glaxo put me through training. And then I joined a company, a com computer consulting company called NIIT. Uh, if I had stuck with them, uh, I'd be playing golf right now instead of talking to you all. <laughs> but- uh, Is that good or bad? <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, I worked with them and then I worked with uh, Hindustan Petroleum, which is uh, Exxon in India. I was their marketing manager. But my passion was, uh, you know, I started teaching, uh, uh, I did my MBA while I was working and then uh, my, uh, uh, my director uh, called me, he, he by the way is uh, a Jesuit priest. Uh, 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 and the university that I went to is uh, Loyola College. Uh, uh, and I've been through all the Catholic uh, school names that you can talk about. My primary was in Dominic Savio. My middle was in St. Bede's. My high school was in St. Mary's. Uh, uh, my, uh, so you know the drill. I know the Catholic uh, uh, thing. I've had communion. Catholicism in India was, uh, uh, was very open, uh, very inclusive, and all of that. So we come from a melting pot. Uh, and because all paths lead to Oh, self-realization, which is what Hindus think. I have, a, a, you know, Black Madonna. We went to uh, um, Spain, and uh, that's what is in our prayer room. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so we consider all gods to be, uh, you know, to be leading to the same goal of self-realization. So, uh, what happens is, uh, I finally said my calling is in teaching, and so uh, I'm from the business community, worked in business. And finally, this is what I found was my passion. And Hinduism tells you, do what you do best. And this was my passion. And so uh, the only way to realize that passion was to get myself a PhD. So I came to the University of Arkansas, the Walton College of Business. Uh, and uh, two days after I landed here, I started teaching principles of marketing. And uh, it's been 29 years now. Uh, and I've had a good you run. You got your PhD? I got my PhD, <laughs> and I've been a tenured professor uh, now at Texas State. I've been teaching at Texas State for 26 years. So so, so this is what I love. This is my passion. And, and how, how do you continue uh, uh, your understanding of all of the texts? Do you go to the temple regularly? How yeah. do you... The best way to, to understand the text is to live it. And another good way to understand the text is to teach young children. So the moment you teach young children, young children ask you questions. And they are always questioning. And so in Hinduism, we don't tell, hey, you know, that's the answer. Uh, the, the best teachers in Hinduism would always try to find a way to explain things. And there are all these books, there are all these treatises, there's everything available. So as long as you read it, and as long as you can teach your children that, then you're in good shape. That's a good way to understand. So I do teach at the Sunday school. I used to do it for a while, and now, now I've gotten over it. But now it's all about practice. And as far as children go, as far as other adults go, uh, you know, they don't listen to what you preach. They see what you do, and that's what uh, you know, will, will communicate. So you got to do it in action, not just talking. So if you act upon your beliefs, that itself is the best role model. And that's what Mahatma Gandhi talked about. So there's this little story I'd like to tell you guys about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, a mom came with a child to Mahatma Gandhi and told Mahatma Gandhi, hey, you know, he wants to eat sugar. He wants to eat candy. Can you tell him that candy is bad for him? And uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, okay, come back in a week and I'll tell you the answer. So uh, a week later, the mother comes with the child and Mahatma Gandhi tells the child, hey, please don't eat sugar, please don't eat candy because it's bad for you. And the mom says, why didn't you tell this last week? Why did you make us come back? So Mahatma Gandhi said, first, I had to internalize it. I had to learn that 
sugar was bad for me and I had to give up sugar. So if I could give up sugar, then I could tell somebody that you need to give up sugar. So it took him one week to give up on sugar. And once he gave up sugar, he started preaching it. So that's the way it has to be. So we've got to live our faith. And if you live your faith, then those actions speak louder than words. And that's the best way to communicate to children and to others. So in, in uh, Hindu temples, who manages all of the ritual, et cetera? Because you must have practices and that that wouldn't be you necessarily, even though you're an elder in, in, the, in the... Yeah, in the... yeah. Here, uh, we do have like what is the equivalent of a pastor who's called an acharya. Uh, there's also the priests who take care of the deity worship. Uh, and they typically are Brahmin, but in the temple that I go to, uh, it was not a Brahmin at all who was the priest till, till last year. So for three years, we had a priest who was a non-Brahmin. You who, call them priests? Uh, yeah, we call them priests. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, so they come in, uh, but Hinduism tells you there's no intermediary between you and God. These priests are only helping you find peace uh, and, you know, uh, you know, do the daily oblations and the rituals to the gods. But, but wherever you go, it's all about realizing that God through that form in you. So, so there are these priests, but again, all of that is changed. Today, uh, today all of these uh, uh, temples are allowing uh, non-Brahmins to become priests. Uh, 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 it, is, it is quite common now. And so we have had in the U.S. a non-Brahmin priest who came in and worked at our temple at, uh, um, in Austin. So, so, uh, so the, and it is uh, different organizations have different structures. Uh, the Austin Hindu temple has a different structure. It's an elected body. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, institutions have different structures. Well, the last question I think we're going we're to run out of time is someone asked to have you describe a weeding. Wedding. Wedding. Sorry. Wedding. wedding. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the best thing that I can tell you is if you are ever invited by an Indian to attend any wedding anywhere, <laughs> take it and go. Why? That's the best way to experience it. It's fun, it's color, it's different foods. It, it gives you India in a nutshell, okay? So it's everything. Is it one day, many days? It depends. If you have lots of money, it's three days. Uh, uh, if, if you are in the U.S., you have very many wedding celebrations. Uh, you know, you go to India, you have a wedding. You come here, you have a reception. You have Mahendi, you have all kinds of things. You have the, uh, the bridegroom coming in on a horse again, you know, it fall back to the Aryan tradition because the horse was considered to be a, a big deal, uh, you know, in transportation and so on. So, and in Texas, it, uh, it fits perfectly. So, uh, so you could come on a horse and a barat with uh, lots of uh, bridesmen and, and uh, all of this, it's real fun. Uh, it's lots of uh, good company, lots of, uh, talking, lots of matchmaking. So Hindus uh, go to all these marriages if they want to find a, a spouse, uh, because that's the best way to find one, because <laughs> you find all of these people coming there. So uh, it's better, it beats the bar. So <laughs> it beats the workplace. So if you do get an opportunity, uh, do attend an Indian wedding. And I can tell you, it's fun. Wherever it is, if it's in the US or in India, uh, I have had uh, lots of friends who want to uh, go to India for this uh, uh, and people ask me this all the time in fact uh, we are taking my daughter's Jewish friend uh, 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 to India this uh, this summer and we said we are going to go to Rajasthan it's in the desert it's uh, it's really hot but she said hey this is the only time I can come before I go on to college and I'd love to do it and her goal is she wants to marry a princess. And she told my daughter, you are going to come to my wedding in India. This is what uh, her friend uh, uh, told her because she loves Indian weddings. She's been to a wedding here. And so she wants an Indian wedding. Uh -huh. A Jewish girl in Austin, Texas. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So uh, uh, I, I really would like to thank you for uh, coming and speaking to us. The goal is, is that we have... Uh, as you know, the technology industry is uh, extremely diverse, and uh, sometimes we forget what uh, diversity means. 
uh, because uh, lack of education or lack of understanding of all the various uh, religions and, uh, uh, and inclusion. It's hard to be inclusive and diverse uh, if you don't understand the basic moral concepts that, uh, that you, uh, you should, uh, uh, you should uh, live by. Because once you have a moral framework, uh, and no religion has, no, has a monopoly, per se, in what you said, that uh, Hinduism includes all of the other uh, gods, so it's a fairly inclusive. That may be, inc it may be inclusive because of the massive interest in the, uh, in the area where it started, mm -hmm. because it's so fertile. Yeah. And it could feed uh, mm -hmm. people. Getting yeah. back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's mm -hmm. hard to worry about some of these issues if you don't have so enough to yeah. eat uh, yeah. every day. Yeah. So, so we uh, we're taking a uh, we're taking a different view of this uh, speaker series. It's not just about uh, uh, problems that we have exclusively in the United States per se or in the technology community, but sort of the basic understanding of what you need in order to make diversity and inclusion work. So we'd like to thank you uh, very, uh, very much. We've had a lot of thumbs up for your talk, and so we thank you. Thanks a bunch. Thanks for having me, and I'm glad you're open and inclusive. Thank I you. really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.